Good day. I am Dr. Rommel Gonzalez, UPCM, Class 2013. Currently, I am a CL Psychiatry Fellow from the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine. Today, I will give a lecture on time management using the Quadrant 2 process developed by Dr. Stephen Covey and his colleagues. Please prepare a piece of pen and paper during this lecture. These will be used to answer questions later. As this session is recorded, you may review the video after in case you need to revisit some questions. This is the outline of my presentation. Now, please take out a piece of pen and paper, or if you don't have these on hand, please open your cell phone calculator to take the urgency index test. This was also developed by Dr. Covey, and he used it in his book, First Things First. Note that this is not a validated tool here in the Philippines. However, at least this would give you an idea which items resonate with you more? Items which are reflective of some level of sense of urgency. Let us begin. Provide the number which mostly closely represents your normal behavior or attitudes regarding the statement below. Zero represents never, one seldom, two sometimes, three often, and four Always. Number one, I seem to do my best work when I am under pressure. Two, I blame the rush and pressure of external things on my failure to spend deep, introspective time with myself. Three, I am frustrated by the slowness of people and things around me. I hate to wait or stand in line. Four, I feel guilty when I take time off work. Five, I seem to be rushing between places and events. Six, I find myself pushing people away so I can finish a project. Seven, I feel anxious when I am out of touch with the office for more than a few minutes. Eight, I am preoccupied with one thing when I'm doing something else. Nine, I am at my best when I am handling a crisis situation. 10, the adrenaline rush from a new crisis seems more satisfying to me than the steady accomplishment of long-term results. 11. I give up quality time with important people in my life to handle crises. 12. I assume people will naturally understand if I have to disappoint them or let things go in order to handle a crisis. 13. I rely on solving a crisis to give my day a sense of meaning and purpose. 14. I eat lunch or other meals while I work. 15. I keep thinking that someday I will be able to do what I really want to do. And finally, 16. A huge stack in my out basket at the end of the day makes me feel like I have really been productive. Now, Please add your scores and compare the total to the values on screen. If most of your responses are, are on the low end, there is a probably low urgency mindset or di ka palaging nagmamadali. If, you, if you're in the middle or toward the higher end, there's a possibility that urgency is your fundamental operational mindset. If your responses are consistently high, perhaps it's already bordering on urgency addiction or hinahanap-hanap mo ang sense of urgency to feel good. It is important to realize that urgency itself is not the problem. The problem is that when urgency, 
is the dominant factor in our lives and importance is not. When the first things in our lives are the urgent things, we sometimes become so caught up in doing them that we don't even stop to ask ourselves if what we're doing is important and needs to be done right there and then. Above are some questions we could reflect on to help us focus on important things. What is the one activity that you know if you did superbly well and consistently would have significant positive results in your personal life? Hmm. Another question is, what is the one activity that you know if you did superbly well and consistently would have significant positive results in your professional or work life? And are you doing them right now? Let's spend five seconds on this slide, then I'll shift to the next. You may write the answers on your piece of paper or answer them mentally. Okay, please keep those questions and corresponding answers on the side for now, and we will review them later. Let us shift our attention to our case beneath and see later on how we could apply the principles of quadrant two time management. This is the case of MS, a medical student in a university in, a man in Manila. She has daily classes from 8 to 5 p.m. with 12 to 1 p.m. lunch break. She has, uh, her classes are composed of synchronous and asynchronous lectures and activities. And uh, she has a nagging feeling that she's not making enough time for, for her family and her exercise routine. During weekends, she feels anxious and reports difficulty prioritizing activities such as studying for exams and atten attending family or sports or exercise activities. This would make her turn to Netflix or to cell phone games to alleviate her anxiety, but this is usually followed by feelings of guilt. <clears throat> okay. Before we help our character using the quadrant two process, let me introduce you first to the time matrix management or to the time management matrix. The time management matrix helps us focus on the issue of urgency and importance more effectively. As you can see, it categorizes our activities into four quadrants. We spend time in these four quadrants de depending on the activity we do. Vertically, it classifies activities as important or not important, and horizontally as urgent or not urgent. Quadrant one refers to urgent and important things, last minute preparation, presentations, cramming for exams the night prior are examples. Many of our important activities may become urgent through procrastination like papers and studying for exams, when we are not able to engage in prevention or planning. Quadrant two uh, refers to those activities that are not urgent, but important. Long range planning, anticipating and preventing problems, activities that increase our skills through reading and continuous professional development. Ignoring this quadrant feeds and enlarges quadrant one, creating stress, burnout, and deeper crisis for the person consumed by it. In contrast, investing in this quadrant shrinks quadrant one. Planning, preparation, and prevention keep many things from becoming urgent. Remember that quadrant two does not act on us. We must act on it. Quadrant three are urgent but not important things. Many phone calls, group messages, for instance, some individuals feel that they must respond to Viber, Telegram, or FB messenger messages immediately. But when asked to reflect if they really need, needed to respond ASAP, they realize that it wasn't necessary. The noise of urgency creates the illusion of importance. But the actual activities, if they're important at all, they would be only important to someone else. It is called the quadrant of deception. We spend a lot of time in quadrant three meeting other people's priorities and expectations 
thinking we're really in quadrant one. Finally, quadrant four are neither urgent nor important things. Trivia, busy work, watching movie marathons that leave us feeling drained. This is the quadrant of waste. We are sometimes, we are uh, sometimes so battle scarred from being tossed around in quadrant one and three that we often escape to quadrant four for survival. However, quadrant four is not survival. It is deterioration. It may initially give you a sense of excitement, but we soon find there is nothing there. If you were to place each of your last week's activities into one of these quadrants, where would you say you spent the majority of your time? We should think carefully as we consider quadrants one and three. It is easy to think because it is urgent, it is important. A quick way to differentiate between these quadrants is to ask yourself if the urgent activity contributed to one or several of your important objectives of the week. If not, it probably belongs to quadrant three. It is most likely that we spend majority of our time in quadrant one and three. Now, let's go back to the questions raised at the start. First, what is the one activity that you know if you did superbly, and cons superbly well and consistently would have significant positive results in your personal life? And second, what is the one activity that you know if you did superbly well and consistently would have significant positive results in your professional or work life? Analyze which quadrant your answers are in. There is a high probability that they are in quadrant two. Your answers may fall under any of these seven categories. Better preparation, better planning and organizing, taking better care of self, improving communication with people, seizing new opportunities, personal development, and empowerment. All of these activities are in quadrant two. They're important and for most of the time not come with a sense of urgency to them. The value of the matrix is that it helps us to see how importance and urgency affect the choices we make about how to spend our time. It allows us to see where we spend most of our time and why we spend it there. Now, let us proceed with the details of quadrant two process of time management. Exactly how do we do it step by step? What you see is a modified quadrant two worksheet developed by Stephen Covey and his colleagues. We will go from left to right. This worksheet will help us con concretize our thoughts and make more sense out of them. From left to right, we see the categories of mission, roles, goals, and the days of the week. And below the label, other responsibilities. I will explain them one by one in a bit. As we present the steps in the process, I suggest that you consider them carefully, write things down. The more involved you are, the more significant the learning will be. I also suggest that you look over these worksheets and then use it to organize the next week of your life according to the six step process that follows. I want to emphasize that the system is not a magic tool. The system is designed to improve the process of quadrant two organizing, but the same process can be done in a modified daily planner or on a computer, a spiral notebook, a cell phone, or even a paper napkin. We will begin with the first two columns of quadrant two worksheet. Everything begins with what is most important to us. Each person has a unique sense of what makes meaning in their lives. Hence, step one would be connecting with what's most important in your life as a whole, considering the big picture, what you care about, what makes the moments in your life meaningful. Here are some questions that you would want to ask to help you. Number one, what's most important for you? Two, what gives your life meaning? And three, what do you want to be and do in your life? Many people put their answers to such questions in a written mission statement, which capture what they want to be 
and what they want to do in their life. Clarity of these issues is critical because it, it affects everything else. The goals you set, the decisions you make, the paradigms or views you have, the way you spend your time. In the ladder of success, you want to climb a ladder that is leaning against the, the right wall. We don't want you to keep on climbing the success ladder only finding out that as you reach the top of the ladder, you realize that it is leaning on the wrong wall. For a character in the vignette, she gave this as a mission statement, a diligent medical student who gives her best in her studies, a daughter who cares for her parents by spending time with them, an athlete who takes good care of her health. For now, we will place the mission statement of our character here. This will help her navigate the next steps. We now go to step two. Step two is to identify one's roles. We live our lives in terms of roles at work, in the family, in the community, or in other areas of life. Roles represent responsibilities, relationships, and areas where we could contribute. Much of our pain in life comes from the sense that we're succeeding in one role at the expense of the other, which may be even more important role. We may be succeeding in meeting our needs as medical students, but failing to meet our own needs for personal development and growth. Having a clear set of roles provides a natural framework to create order and balance. If you have a sense of what is most important for you based on step one, your roles will grow out of it. Balance among roles does not, in, does not simply mean that you're spending time in each role, but that these roles work together for the accomplishment of what's most important for you. That is your mission. List the roles that come to your mind in whatever way feels comfortable for you. Don't be overly concerned about getting them right the first time. It may, it may take some time before you feel they capture the various facets of your life in a way that works for you. There is no set way to do it. Another person doing almost the same things you do might define his or her roles differently. Have a separate foundation rule called, called sharpen the saw, which describes the energy that we invest in increasing our personal capacity in the fundamental areas. These are the physical, social, mental, and spiritual areas. We separate this rule for two reasons. First, it is a rule that everyone has. And second, it is a found, it is, it's foundational for success in every other role. We often get so busy that we forget to sharpen our saw. We may neglect to exercise or fail to attend to our key relationships, or we may not be clear about what's important and meaningful to us. If we fail to build our personal capacity in these areas, we quickly become dull and worn out from the imbalance. We're unable to move forward effectively in other roles of our lives. It is important that these roles form a highly interrelated whole. Uh, please note that we mentioned spirituality and not religion. The difference is that religion is a specific set of organized beliefs and practices usually shared by a community or group. In contrast, spirituality is more of an individual practice, not necessarily tied with religion, that has to do with having a sense of peace and purpose. Here, we see that our character identified her roles as being a medical student, a doctor, and an athlete. All these roles are important to her. We're not trying to break down her life and fit, into neat, fit them into neat little boxes on a planning page. We are creating a variety of perspectives from which to examine her life to ensure balance and harmony. Remember that the paradigm is always one of importance and interdependence. 
This means that though they may appear separated from each other in this image, in real life, we know that our important roles are interdependent and sometimes we have activities wherein we do two roles at the same time. For example, when we have coffee time or break time with a good friend, we are actually fulfilling the role of friend. And at the same time, when you are relaxed, you are sharpening your saw. Before we proceed to step three, let's have a little story about setting goals. Above, we see a jar representing time, the big rocks as the highest priority projects and tasks, the pebbles or little rocks as high priority projects and tasks, and the sand, and the sand are the unimportant projects and tasks. If you fill your jar with gravel and sand first, you won't have space for your big rocks. If we know what the big rocks are and put them in first, it's amazing how many we can put in and how much of the sand and gravel fits in between the spaces. So what's the lesson of the story? It's not actually about doing as many as possible work in our limited time. Regardless of what else actually fits in, the key point is that the big rocks or the highest priority projects and tasks, our quadrant one and two goals, those that are most important are in first. So from that story, we now proceed to step three. With your roles identified, you select quadrant one and two goals in each role. You may ask yourself this question. What's the most important thing I could do in each role this week to have the greatest positive impact? You'll probably have several goals you'd like to set in each role. But for now, limit yourself to the one or two goals that are most important. You may even feel, based on your inner compass, that you should not set goals in every role this week. Write your goals in the goals area of the weekly worksheets. So this is where you put your goals based on the question raised or questions raised a while back. For our character in the vignette, these are her stated goals for the week. As med student, she would like to study two hours daily during weekdays and four to six hours daily during weekends. As a daughter, she would like to attend family activities during Sundays and call her parents twice weekly during her free time, and as an athlete, to attend four-hour football practice during Saturdays. Step four, create a decision-making fra uh, framework for the week. Scheduling quadrant one and two goals is a big step toward putting first things first. If we don't put the quadrant one and two activities in place first, it is easy for the week to be filled by the flood of activities from quadrants three and four that constantly clamor for your attention. When we put the big rocks in first, we create a framework to accomplish what we feel is important, around which we can then fit in other activities. This is where you write your weekly activities in this worksheet. You'll notice that there are two kinds of areas on the weekly worksheet for each day. One is divided into the hours for specific activities. The other provides space to list priorities for the day. To, ske to, schedule, to schedule quadrant one and two goals, either set a specific time during the day to work on the goal or list it as a priority of the day. <clears throat> Above, we see that our character already placed her quadrant one and two activities on the worksheet. Since our character is a med student, she placed her quadrant one activities first on the sheet as these are the important and urgent matters of the week. After which, she placed her quadrant two activities in both the time-sensitive areas and the other priorities area. 
she used time-sensitive and non-time-sensitive planning for the day. Time-sensitive activity is an activity whose value is attached to specific time of the day. Attending classes from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., for instance, is a time-sensitive activity and can be considered as urgent and important daily activity, whereas calling parents during free time is important but not necessarily urgent. By separating time-sensitive activities from the rest, you're able to make more effective scheduling decisions and remain sensitive to important commitments. Note, because an activity is scheduled in the time-sensitive area, does not automatically mean when the time arrives, you quit what you are doing and shift focus. You may be involved in something genuinely more important and forgo of the scheduled activity. For instance, even if exercise is a time-sensitive activity for our character on a Thursday night, since she has an exam the next day, Friday, she decided to forgo of her exercise routine because she genuinely believed that spending more time studying was the best use of her time that particular Thursday night. Remember that while we do our best to plan what's important based on available knowledge, the fact is that life is not the automatic incarnation of a planning page. No matter how well the page is written, the key is your ability to discern between the two activities and determine which is more important at the time. For instance, if our character is not available to call her family on Tuesday due to class schedule changes, she can draw an arrow to cross to Wednesday. This way, the priority is on her mind. She is looking for the right occasion and she can see what's happening in her week with regard to it. Step five says that the daily task is to keep the first things first while navigating through the unexpected opportunities and challenges of the day. There are two things you can do at the beginning of the day that will enhance your ability to put first things first. First, preview the day. It's spending a few moments at the beginning of the day to revisit your schedule, enabling you to get your bearings, check your compass, look at the day in the context of the week. And second, you prioritize. You might find it helpful to be mindful of which is your quadrant one or quadrant two activities. This gives an additional opportunity to ensure that quadrant three activities haven't slipped into your schedule in disguise. Some people prefer to use the ABC or the one, two, three method, assigning each item an A, B, or C, or one, two, and three, depending on importance, and always working on A's or number ones first. Here are some questions that could help us act with integrity at the moment of choice. One, what's the best use of my time right now? Two, what's the most important, what's, the, what's most important right now? And three, what's the right thing to do right now? Remember that we should pause between a stimulus and a response to proactively choose a response that is deeply integrated with what is most important to us. So we may ask that we so we may ask and answer the question. What's the best use of my time right now before we respond to a particular stimulus? On a daily basis, we increase our ability to act with integrity as we learn to do the same thing through practicing this important pause between stimulus and response to identify the best use of our time based on importance and urgency and not urgency alone. Evaluation is the final step and the first step in this cycle of upward spiral growth. Step six takes us back to the beginning of the process, but with greater capacity. As we learn from our week, we are better prepared to see what's most important for us. We identify our roles, then set our goals, then create a framework for a new week 
and finally act with integrity in the moment of choice. As we organize, act, and evaluate, organize, act, and evaluate, organize, act, and evaluate, our weeks become repeated cycles of learning and growth. Unless we learn from our daily and weekly experiences, we will keep on making the same mistakes, struggle with the same problem week after week. At the end of the week, before you organize the following week, ask, yourselves this, ask yourself these questions. What goals did I achieve? In making decisions, did I keep first things first? What challenges did I encounter? How did I overcome them? What goals did I, did I not achieve? What kept me from accomplishing these goals? What can I learn from the week as a whole? The Quadrant 2 organizing process reinforces the importance paradigm. The greatest value of the process is not what it does to your schedule, but what it does to your mind. As we begin to think more in terms of importance and not just urgency, you begin to see time differently. You become more empowered to put first things first. Now, I will mention a little bit about the concern of procrastination, as this is also an issue tactic in time management. Procrastination is a normal human behavior with a wide variety of expression. All of us are guilty of it from time to time. Generally speaking, procrastination is the conscious act of giving concentrated attention to tasks that have a low priority in your already very busy lives. The, there are multitude of reasons why we procrastinate. These are some of the reasons. The person wants to avoid completing the work that is to be judged or scrutinized by others. The person is struggling with decisions. The, he is ignoring or she is, he or she is ignoring undesired or unwanted tasks. He or she has, in, uh, has inherent ability to say no to requests for, for her time or for his or her time and effort. Or he or she is struggling with perfectionism. There are perhaps three main ways to deal with procrastination. Once you have identified this habit in yourself, you can take steps to prevent procrastination, try to get unstuck on your own when you recognize a problem, or seek outside help. Here are some advice on addressing procrastination. First, it is important to identify your strengths and weaknesses. It is useful to know your best hours within the cycle of a day for creativity, focus, and productivity. When you are aware of your own rhythms, you can use them to your advantage, such as by not scheduling tasks that you dread for a time of the day when you are typically at low productivity. Second, remove distractions from your working environment such as turning off smartphones, email notifications, social media, and uh, so on during your study time. Finally, use tools that promote concentration and focus. Some use the Pomodoro app or a similar app known as Forest. These tools vary from person to person, but might include background music, white noise, subdued lighting, and so on. Of course, don't forget to use the quadrant two process I just described a while back. Finally, many people who are struggling with procrastination need an external source of support to help them overcome the problem. This help can come from mentors, mental health professionals, and peers. For mentors, mentors are rich in their life experience and generous in their desire to support others 
in earlier phases of their career. They can give you advice on how to deal with procrastination based on their own experiences. Mental health professionals, it occasionally happens that the person trying to overcome procrastination is in fact struggling with a personal health problem that warrants detailed assessment, diagnosis, and treatment. For instance, the person may have anxiety disorder, ADHD, or depression, preventing him or her from focusing on, on his or her studies. Peers. Our peers can be, can be a tremendous support as we strive to overcome procrastination. Many have struggled with similar issues, have implemented their own solutions and strategies that we can learn from vicariously. Finally, published in other resources. There are many online resources and books dedicated to, the, to defeat uh, procrastination. Many of these may resonate with you, others may not. Hence, it is based on goodness of fit with your need. I hope with this lecture on time management, you were able to learn the importance of putting first things first in your journey as medical students. These are the books I used in making this lecture. And that was my, my, that was my last slide. Thank you very much and good day, everyone.